Welcome to Ancient World Studies. My name is Dr. Raoul McLaughlin. The question is, why did the Romans explore Inner Africa? The second Roman expedition to the Garamantic Kingdom. The next Roman expedition to enter the Sahara occurred during the Civil War of AD 69. While Roman authorities were distracted by more important military concerns, local townships in North Africa took the opportunity to engage in violent territorial disputes. In Regio Tripolitania, a land dispute between the coastal cities of Oea and Lepsis Magna rapidly escalated. When the people of Oea appeared to be losing, they summoned assistance from the Garamantes, who arrived with a large war band to overrun the olive groves and carefully managed field systems surrounding Lepsis. This intervention by the Garamantes was an act of war by foreign people that required an immediate response. Tacitus explains that. A quarrel originating in robberies of grain and cattle by two rustic populations had grown from this insignificant beginning into pitched battles. The people of Oea, who were inferior in numbers, had summoned to their aid the Garamantes, a wild race incessantly occupied in robbing their neighbours. This had brought the people of Lepsis to extremities, and when their territories had been widely ravaged, they cowered behind their city walls. Roman retaliation would initiate another phase in Saharan exploration. The Roman governor, Valerius Festus, sent an advance force of fast-moving light auxiliaries, including mounted cavalry, into the region. These forces routed the Garamantes before the Third Legion had been fully mobilised and marched into position. Together, these Roman forces managed to intercept the raiders and recapture most of the stolen possessions, Tacitus reports. The Garamantes fled at the arrival of the auxiliary infantry and cavalry, the whole of the booty was recaptured, except for some items which the plunderers, in their wanderings through inaccessible villages, had sold to more distant tribes. According to Roman systems of honour, retaliation was required, both as a punishment and a deterrent against future transgressions. Pliny confirms that routes into the Fasan were not known with certainty, since the Garamantes concealed from strangers the location of frontier wells and watering points. Nevertheless, the Romans advanced against them, and marching into the inner desert, they discovered a shorter, four-day route into Garamantic territory, passing a landmark known as the Head of the Rock. This route may have passed through Mizda and Garet El Garba to reach Brak at the northernmost oasis, the Wadi Ashati. Pliny describes this expedition as a war, but it was probably a brief campaign with the Garamantes submitting to Roman terms once the army penetrated the desert barrier and reached their oasis network. But although the Garamantes capitulated, there was no conquest or permanent occupation of their territory. It is speculation, but perhaps from this era onwards, the Garamantes were placed more firmly within the Roman sphere of dominance. The geographer Claudius Ptolemy refers to another expedition into Garamantic territory, occurring about ten years later. This episode is not mentioned by Pliny the Elder, who completed and published his natural history in about AD 75. Ptolemy refers to a Septimius Flaccus, who travelled from the land of the Garamantes to the Ethiopians, Sub-Saharans. Ptolemy reports that Septimius Flaccus made a campaign out of Libya, and entering the land of the Garamantes, he marched south for three months to reach the Ethiopians. Perhaps Septimius Flaccus was a legate in command of a small Roman force sent on a military expedition with specific objectives. But if so, what was the purpose of this mission? One possibility is that this expedition was a special military command similar to the Nile expedition dispatched by the Emperor Nero. In AD 62, Nero sent a small group of tribunes and Praetorian guards into Nubia to explore Africa 
and locate the sources of the Nile. This group approached the king of Moreau, Meroe, and received royal support to pass through his kingdom and explore the lands beyond. Perhaps Domitian sent his own explorer team into Africa, but this time it was with the support of the Garamantes. The mission by Septimius Flaccus probably reached the forested region near Lake Chad, but no record describing this journey survives. The historian Tacitus despised Domitian, and when the emperor died, he was subject to damnatio memorae. This was a process where his monuments, statues and public inscriptions were torn down, demolished or defaced. But some things could not be destroyed, and popular bronze coins from this period clearly depict an African black rhino, rhinoceros by Cornus, and imperial coins issued by the emperor. This animal was native to the central region of sub-Saharan Africa, a thousand miles from the Roman frontier. So what exactly was being commemorated by this coin? The question is, how did Domitian get his rhino? Ptolemy provides an answer when he discusses newly acquired information about the southern extent of Africa. He reports that a Roman named Julius Maternus travelled south from Leptis Magna into Garamantic territory. This probably occurred in AD 81, soon after the military expedition by Septimius Flaccus. By this period, the Garamantes had a ruling chief, designated as their king. When Maternus reached the Garamantic capital, he discovered that the king was planning an expedition across the southern desert to reinforce his rule over sub-Saharan populations. Ptolemy reports that Julius Maternus set out from Leptis Magna and accompanied the king of the Garamantes who was making an expedition against the Ethiopians. After they had all marched for four months to the south, they reached Agisimba in the Ethiopian country where the rhinoceros congregate. Agisimba may have been near Lake Chad, which had tribal groups that the Garamantes ruled directly, or as the dominant power extracted tribute or services. The ancient name Agisimba resembles an early Bantu phrase meaning land of the lion. Ptolemy still adhered to Greek theories that Africa was a small continent barely extending beyond the Sahara. He therefore dismissed the distance travelled by Maternus, Ptolemy argues. These accounts are implausible because the inland Ethiopians, sub-Saharans, cannot even be a three-month journey from the Garamantes. The Garamantes are virtually Ethiopians and have the same king as the inland Ethiopians. Ptolemy was incorrect about the size of Africa but he raised a valid point about the expedition. He argued that the journey of several months was probably not a continuous passage made in a single southward direction. Instead, the journey was probably a tour of widely spaced regions containing a network of oasis sites and watering holes. Ptolemy argues, It would be preposterous to think that the king's expedition to his subjects was in just one direction, from north to south, when these people are stretched out far on either side, to the east and west. It is also incorrect to imagine that the king made no significant pauses anywhere in his journey. Perhaps the king allowed Maternus to accompany members of the royal court on an inspection tour of his outer territories. Maternus might have been a commercial agent, or perhaps a Roman military official assigned the task of assisting an allied regent. Alternatively, the emperor may have sent him on a mission to acquire exotic animals for a grand event in the Flavian Amphitheatre in Rome. This monumental building, in the centre of Rome, is now known as the Colosseum. Its construction was begun by Domitian's father Vespasian and completed by AD 80, during the reign of his older brother Titus. When Domitian came to power in the following year, he enhanced the Colosseum with an additional upper-level galleries that increased crowd capacity to up to 80,000 people. He also ordered the construction of a network of underground pens and galleries in the arena, which allowed animals to be released into the combat area 
through concealed trapdoors. Perhaps these improvements favoured the display of large animals that had a high visual impact, even when seen from a great height and distance. Domitian might very well have sent teams to find and secure the largest African animals. There is precedent for these activities, as it is well known that the Emperor Nero sent a Roman officer on an expedition 600 miles beyond the northern frontiers to procure precious amber from the Baltic coast. The amber was used to adorn spectacular gladiator games in Rome, including dramatic beast hunts. Pliny records that the officer brought back so plentiful a supply of amber that the nets used for keeping the beasts away from the parapets of the amphitheatre were adorned with amber pieces. The spectacle was to demonstrate the unique wealth and political prowess of Nero in securing distant resources. In AD 82, the Romans completed the subjugation of Britain. Imperial forces were sent to explore the entire north coast of Scotland under the orders of a governor named Julius Agricola. Captured Caledonian bears were transported to Rome as a symbolic prize to be displayed and killed in the arenas. Perhaps Domitian wanted to match this show with a further display of Roman power and influence from southern extremities. According to Tacitus, the emperor was jealous and suspicious of his governor Agricola. He could therefore have sought to upstage or diminish his achievements at popular public venues. Acquiring an African rhino may have been a solution to his political insecurities. The creature was indeed a popular spectacle, and unlike anything the crowd would have seen before. In a series of poetic verses, Marshall commemorated a set of extraordinary games that Domitian held in the Flavian Amphitheatre. The emperor's unique African rhino was a prime attraction in these shows. Before each performance, it was irritated into a rage by being teased by a ball covered in red cloth. Marshall recalls, The rhinoceros was exhibited in the whole arena, and it fought decisive battles for you, Emperor. With lowered head and terrible wrath, it powered forth. With its powerful horn, it struck a bull as if it were a mere ball. The games culminated in a repeat performance by the celebrated rhino, which was made to charge a bear. Marshall writes, Finally, the rhino's well-known fury returned. As easily as a bull tosses into the air the balls placed upon its horns, so the rhino with its double horns hurled aloft the heavy bear. To capitalise on the popularity of this exhibit, the emperor had numerous low-value coins issued bearing the image of the animal. These bronze coins, known as quadrams, were minted in large numbers between AD 83 and AD 85, and were made widely available to the masses in Rome. Later, this motif reappeared on coins issued by the Alexandrian Mint in AD 92. Despite this symbolic image of Roman power in Africa, the territory of the Garamantes remained independent. When Tacitus published his histories in the early 2nd century AD, their Saharan kingdom was not considered part of the empire. Ultimately, the monuments that Domitian erected to his distant imperial schemes were destroyed by Damnatio Memori, the destruction of monuments. But the small bronze coins carried in the purses and pockets of ordinary Romans, survived annihilation. They still provide a fascinating insight into the Roman view of Africa, as somewhere dramatic, distant and dangerous. Thank you for your attention.